Dear Father in heaven, thank you very, very much, dear God, for your word. Thank you for choosing to speak to us in such difficult and dark times. Thank you, dear God, that even when the storm clouds surround us, you assure us that these clouds will never be able to keep the sun away forever. That, dear God, while we may be surrounded with dismay and discouragement, Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, will shine through it all and brighten our hearts amazingly. Thank you, dear God. Thank you for the promise that in you we are more than conquerors. Thank you for your word that has enabled us to walk the narrow path you've chosen. Help us, Lord, to be found walking steadfastly in the light of the Lord, in the love of the Lord. May your name be praised, magnified, and adored. Teach us, dear God, how to love you more, more than anything. Thank you, O God. Help us that the truths that we have learned may be applied through the rest of this week, through the rest of our lives, into eternity, that we may be found reflecting your character before the world. Thank you, God. Bless your child who has shared. I pray that your Holy Spirit will possess and fill and empower forevermore. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
is entitled The Tone Wail. We are going to explore the cross of Jesus and why the wail was torn. We're going to look at various angles to see what message we can get from this topic. The Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, the mention of a supernatural event that took place the very moment Jesus breathed his last. They talk about the event that happened in the temple. Let's see what Matthew records. Matthew chapter 27 verses 50 and 51 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Beloved God, the Father, He tore the veil of the temple, the center of worship, and it was Passover day. Millions of people had gathered there. God tore that most significant wail from top to bottom to signify that something very important happened on Calvary. You know, that wail was the most important cloth piece on planet Earth. We will take a look at that colorful wail that was torn on Good Friday. The wail that was torn was the one that separated the holy place from the most holy place in the Hebrew sanctuary. God's presence was hid behind that whale. Between the two cherubims, the Shekinah, the glory of God was revealed. That whale, brothers and sisters, was like a door to the very presence of God. No one could enter in. That whale is called, in the Bible, the whale of the covering, as you can see here in Exodus chapter 35, verse 12, Exodus 40, and verse 21. Because God was covered from the congregation behind that thick whale. When giving the details of the sanctuary to Moses, God even instructed about the fine details of the whale as well. You see, it's a very colorful whale. Exodus 26 and verse 31 reads, And thou shalt make a whale of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twinned linen and of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. Now all these colors had significance in God's plan of salvation. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian who lived during the time of Christ, 
he elaborates on the significance and the colors of that veil of the temple in his famous book, Wars of the Jews, Book 5. He writes, It was a Babylonian curtain embroidered with blue and fine linen and scarlet and purple and a contexture that was truly wonderful. Nor was this mixture of colors without its mystical interpretation, but was a kind of the image of the universe. So he says this whale reflected the sky, the universe, the colors of it. He continues, for by scarlet there seemed to be enigmatically signified fire, by the fine flax, the earth, by the blue, the air, and by the purple, the sea. Two of them having their colors, the foundation of this resemblance, but the fine flax and the purple have their own origin for that foundation, the earth producing the one and the sea the other, says Josephus. Beloved, as God dwells in the third heaven according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2 beyond the colors of the sky and the universe God dwelt in the third division of the sanctuary behind the colorful veil which had the colors of the universe the first apartment we know was the coat the second apartment was the holy place and the third was the most holy place where God was there. In heaven we have the original temple. God told Moses to build a copy of it on earth. The original is in heaven. Many prophets saw it. Isaiah saw the heavenly temple and he wrote thus in Isaiah 4, 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You know, the Hebrew word there for train is shul. And Strong's Hebrew Dictionary gives us the meaning of this word shul. I quote, from an unused root meaning to hang down. A skirt, by implication, a bottom edge, hem, skirt, or train. Now in the context of the temple, the train is the hanging down or the covering or the hem of God's garment. Another version translates it this way. The temple was full of the white skirts of his robe. So the veil was like God's robe. It was the hem of his garment. He was there and this was his covering. And the veil was there that divided the holy from the most holy. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, in Matthew chapter 9, a woman who had an issue of blood she comes and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And what happened? Instantly she was healed. She came by faith. Now touching the hem of Jesus' garment was like touching Jesus himself because it was connected to the Lord himself. So also the priests on a daily basis, they came with blood to the sanctuary. And they would be there at the hem of God's garment. And they would pray before that. And virtue from God flowed from God through his garment. And healed and forgave the people who asked for forgiveness. You know when Jesus died, that veil was torn. The Gospel of Mark talks about the tearing of two things. Mark uses a very rare Greek word not found anywhere in the Bible. He uses the word schizo just twice in the entire Gospel. Once he uses at the baptism of Jesus and once 
at the de death of Jesus, he uses the Greek word schizo. At the precise moment when Jesus began his ministry on earth, the word schizo is used. Writing about the baptism of Jesus, Mark records in Mark 1 and verse 10. And straight away coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the word opened is schizo. And the spirit, like it all, descending upon him. Again, at the precise moment when Jesus ended his ministry on earth, the word schizo is used. Writing about Jesus' death, Mark writes in Mark 15 and verse 38, and the wail of the temple was rent, and that's the Greek word schizo, in twain, from the top to the bottom. Just twice, Mark uses the word schizo. In one place, the sky was rent open, and the other place, the wail of the temple was rent open. There, the voice of God was heard from the torn sky, and here, God's presence departed from the torn veil. As the curtain covered God's presence, beyond this, uh, God's presence in the sanctuary, so also beyond the sky, God's presence was covered as well. And the sky is called a curtain in scripture, as you can read in Psalm 104 and verse 2. Who stretched out the heavens or the skies like a curtain. So you have two curtains here that were torn. Both the curtains, the celestial curtain and the temple curtain were ripped apart, marking the beginning and the ending of Jesus' ministry on earth. And Josephus, remember, told us that the temple curtain reflected the colors of the celestial curtain. In fact, there are some very interesting parallels of the tearing of the two curtains. You see, the baptism concept is seen in both these places. Both occurred, if I may say, during Jesus' baptism. Now we all know Jesus was baptized at River Jordan by John in the water. But there was another baptism that took place on the cross. It is the baptism of fire. Regarding Calvary, Jesus told his own disciples in Mark 10 and verse 38, Can he drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Yes, Jordan was baptism and Calvary also was baptism. The ripping of these two curtains happened at these two baptisms. The Elijah concept was present as well on both these occasions. Regarding John the Baptist, the one who baptized Jesus, Jesus himself said in Matthew 11 verse 14, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come. And on the cross, when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the Jews thought he was calling for Elias. And they wanted to see whether Elias would descend and come to help Jesus. Mark records in Mark 15, 35. And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth for Elias. So you see, the Elias concept was there at both these occasions. The Son of God concept is heard as well. In both the places you hear testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. At River Jordan, the Father, the head of the universe declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And at Calvary, the centurion, the head of the Roman soldiers, he said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Yes, the Son of God concept is declared in both these places. The descending concept is seen as well. At baptism, we see in Mark 1 and verse 10, 
he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like it out descending upon him. Yes, something came down at baptism. The spirit came down. And at the cross, we see in Mark 15 and verse 38, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Yes, something was torn from up to down and the curtains came down. The tearing from top to bottom, beloved, tells us that man did not do it. God did it because if man has to tear anything that is hanging, he will tear it from bottom to the top. But this was done from top to bottom because someone who was at the top up there, God himself in the heavens, tore it. And finally, you see the spirit concept is seen in both the places. We see the Holy Spirit coming down in one place and Jesus' spirit leaving him in another place. Mark 1 and verse 10. He saw the heaven, heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending. Yes, there at baptism, the Father sent the Holy Spirit upon his Son. And at Calvary, Jesus sends his spirit to the Father. He said, Father, into the hands I commend my spirit. Having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Yes, the spirit concept is seen as well. And now we will see what does the tearing mean in the Bible. It has several meanings. We'll pick some of them. It is a sign of mourning. The tearing of the temple signified something of mourning. Remember, <coughs> remember, Jacob's sons, when they brought the coat of many colors of Joseph dipped in animal's blood to prove to their father that Joseph was dead. You know how Jacob reacted? Look at his first reaction. Genesis chapter 37 verse 34 we read, And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. What did he do? As a sign of mourning, he tore his garments apart. And when Job got the news that his children were dead, what did Job do and how did he react? The Bible says in Job 1 and verse 20, Job arose and rent his mantle as a sign of mourning. And we see when King David heard that King Saul and his very close friend Jonathan, the son of King Saul, died. David and his close, close uh, associates, they tore their garments as a sign of mourning, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 1 verses 11 and 12. Then David took hold of his clothes and rent them. And likewise all the men that were with him and they moaned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son. The same way dearly beloved when the Son of God died God the Father tore his very garments apart as any Hebrew father would do at the death of his own son. God wanted the high priest and all the priests and all the people to know that his only begotten son was dead and he was mourning. He wanted heaven and earth to know that now he is a sonless father. You know, the day Jesus died, there was a vertical and a horizontal tearing. First, Jesus himself was torn apart on the cross that was vertical and horizontal in shape. And then there was the vertical tearing of the veil from top to bottom. And there was the horizontal tearing of the earth. As soon as Jesus died. Yes, there is another symbol of that tearing. It was a sign of reconciliation. You know, in the beginning, 
Adam and Eve held open communion with God before the entrance of sin on planet Earth. What joy it was every day for them and for God to meet each other in the garden in the cool of the day, to speak to him face to face in the presence of God is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore, the psalmist says. But as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they feared the presence of God and they hid when they heard his voice behind the trees of the garden. You know, the sinful couple finally were driven from the presence of God from Eden. Sin is a wall of separation between holy God and sinful man. The scripture says in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. But God, even though he drove them out, God was going behind them unseen by them. God was longing to associate with them. He was missing the companionship of the human family. And through the sanctuary, God came very close to man again. He told Moses in Exodus 25 and verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Can you see God, how he longed to be with them? He was dwelling with man in the Garden of Eden, meeting them every day, but sin brought that separation. And God says, I want to dwell with you, but I can dwell with you only through the sanctuary. And God had a thick veil, the curtain that separated him, that kept him apart. You know, we were all quarantined because of sin. God had a special room, an inner room in the sanctuary. The veil separated God from man, but he came so close to man, except for that veil. No man could enter into that room. Even the priests were barred when they came daily to the holy place, even to peep into the sanctuary, into the most holy place. Remember angels? They were there at the gates of the Garden of Eden to stop them from entering into Eden, the presence of God. So also there were angel figures on the curtain indicating uh, to the priest that they cannot cross this line. Exodus 26, 31 says, And thou shalt make a wail with cherubims shall thou make it. Only one man, the high priest, and that too, once a year, he would come beyond the veil into the presence of God on the day of atonement, and that too, with blood of bulls and of goats, with fear and trembling in his heart, he would step into the very presence of God beyond the veil. On a daily basis, the priests would come with blood of animals and stop right in front of the whale. The scripture says in Leviticus 4 and verse 6, And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the whale of the sanctuary. So coming before the whale was coming before the Lord, according to this text, because that's the closest man could come to God before the whale on a daily basis. You know, the blood was not put upon the whale. It was put before the whale. It was sprinkled on the altar of incense, which was before the whale. Remember, one man had the privilege to go to Mount Sinai and behold the glory of God, not the full glory. God said, you cannot see my face and live. No man can do that. But God still displayed his glory. He showed him his back parts. He showed him some of his glory. And when Moses came down from that glorious presence, holding the two tables in his hands, 
the Ten Commandments, the Bible says that Moses' face was shining and glowing that even Aaron, the high priest, felt it very hard to look at the reflected glory from the face of Moses in Exodus 34 and verse 33 till Moses had done speaking with them he put a veil on his face Moses had put a veil so that people can be comfortable beloved if Moses had put a veil to cover his face which reflected the glory of God how much more it was necessary for God to put a thick veil so that his glory would not be seen by people lest they die you know how thick was the veil of that temple according to Josephus the first century Jewish historian he tells us that it was 60 feet high 60 feet and that is almost you know six stories high because 10 feet is one story in our measurement today 60 feet high 30 feet wide and it was four inches thick can you imagine a cloth four inches thick 60 feet high 30 feet wide and you know how many men it took to take and lift the cloth to place it in the temple Josephus tells us 300 men had to lift it up to put that thick cloth in its place God put a thick covering lest his Shekinah goes through and people see his glory and they perish so a veil, a thick veil stood between God and sinful man. It was a closed door all the time. Even though blood was sprinkled in front of it, that veil could not be opened up because the blood of animals, the blood of sheep and goat, bulls and rams, lambs and doves, the blood of all of these animals and birds cannot take away sin. Hebrews 10 and verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. And yet God told them to do because it showed something else. It reflected something else. It prophesied through its symbolism something else. It foreshadowed something else. And that something finally came. Finally, the Lamb of God appeared God himself sent his son in human flesh divinity was clothed in humanity he took a human body God who is a spirit took flesh and bones to cover himself of that glory and then offer himself finally as a sacrifice for humanity Hebrews 10 and verse 8, Jesus is speaking here through prophecy. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. God prepared a body for Jesus for sacrificial purpose. That's why when John introduced him, he introduced him as a lamb that taketh that sacrifice for sin. You know, the whale of the temple was a common veil between God and man. It faced God in the most holy place, correct? And it faced man in the holy place. That veil represent Jesus, represented Jesus, who was that one mediator between God and man. He had two natures. With his divine nature, he could be one with God. And with his human nature, he could be one with man. He came as a lamb of God to take away the sin of the world that separated God and man. That is what Jesus did finally on the cross. The apostle wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on 
the tree. He took our sins in his own body. You know, the whale in the temple was there as a separation between God and man. But when the Lamb of God took away the sin of the world by paying the price with his own blood, there was no reason that that will should remain, should continue to stand. So when Jesus paid the full penalty for sin and died on Calvary, the Father removed the veil of separation that stood between a holy God and a sinful man. Matthew records, Matthew 27, 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That holy blood of the Lamb had eternal value. It was the blood of the everlasting covenant, as the book of Hebrews says. You know, the blood of animals was sprinkled in seven, it was sprinkled seven times before the whale. And Jesus also was bleeding in seven places. His two hands were bleeding because of the nails. His two feet were bleeding because of the nails as well. His head was bleeding because of the crown of thorns. His back was bleeding because of the lashing. And his side was bleeding because of the piercing. Type met anti-type. He was bleeding in seven places exactly. Now, we can know that we all are now beloved, are admitted into the very presence of the Most High God through the open veil. Look at what the apostle wrote in Hebrews 10 verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to come into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the will, that is to say, his flesh. Yes, the tone will represented the tone body of Jesus. Sin had created such a barricade between God and man that it took the broken body of Jesus to break that barricade. Only through the veil, one could enter the presence of God. That separating veil is open for all through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father, unto the Father, but by me. He's the veil. He opened it up that we might come now to the Father through his broken body. He also said in John 10 verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastures. You know, in the garden when Adam sinned and the separation between God and man began, the Bible says. On the cross, when the last Adam took all our sins upon himself, reconciliation between God and man took place. Listen to this grand truth written by Apostle Paul, when God and man get united at the cross of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Look at what the apostle said about Christ bringing us to God through the death of his son. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. In Adam, we were driven from God, but in Christ, we are brought back to that place once again. The tearing of the whale also had another sign. 
It was a sign of the end of the earthly sanctuary. God told Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But this was a sign, the tearing. It is over. In his mad rage, Caiaphas, the high priest, the head of the nation, tore his priestly garments as a symbol of disgust on hearing under oath that Jesus was the Son of God. He pronounced that Jesus must die for blasphemy. Matthew 26 and verse 265. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now he have heard his blasphemy. What think he? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. But actually, Caiaphas had to die according to the law of Moses found in Leviticus 10 for rending his priestly garments, which was a symbol of divine perfection. Leviticus 10 and verse 6 we read, And Moses said unto Aaron, Remember, Aaron was a high priest, And unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die. And wrath come upon all the people. If the priest did that, the priest would die, and wrath would come upon all the people. Yes, God prolonged that a bit to give them an opportunity to turn around. And in AD 70, when they still rebelled, the wrath of God came upon all of them. And the temple was destroyed and one million people died. As the high priest tore his garment, God tore the veil of the temple where the high priest ministered, indicating that his ministry had ended and he was no longer a priest recognized by heaven. And the sanctuary was no longer God's temple. It is finished. There was no need for animal sacrifices anymore. That was Passover. And they were ready to slay that Passover lamb at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But on Calvary's tree, the Lamb of God said, It is finished. And there was an earthquake. And the veil of the temple was rent. And what happened with the earthquake? People trembled. And the high priest's knife dropped down. And the little lamb runs away because he doesn't need to die. The Lamb of God died. There was no need anymore for human mediation. There was no need anymore for animal sacrifice. There was no need anymore for God's presence in the temple of the earthly sanctuary. Because type met anti-type. Shadows met substance. And symbols met reality when Jesus died. Christ put an end to one temple and he inaugurated a better one. We have to follow now Jesus, a high priest, to the heavenly temple by faith. We are told in Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the whale, whither the forerunner is entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the earthly sanctuary, only one high priest would come, only the high priest rather would come into the presence of God once a year with fear and trembling, with the blood of animals. That was a symbol of hope that man through some means, through somebody's blood would be admitted in the presence of God because that priest represented the entire nation. These high priests represented also Jesus Christ. But now, because of what Jesus did with his perfect sacrifice, we are all invited. We are all made priests, by the way. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, we are the royal priesthood. We are now all invited to come into the presence of the Almighty God. God is telling us, don't fear my child like the priest feared when they entered the earthly temp temple. He says, come boldly 
because of what Jesus did. In Hebrews 4 and verse 16 we read, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That throne is called the throne of grace because mercy met wrath and settled the matter of sin forever. From that heavenly mercy seat, we obtain mercy. Jesus stands there and he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. As we close, beloved, I want to tell you a story. Bill and John, two brothers, lived on adjoining farms. But one day, they had a very deep quarrel. Before the quarrel, they met every day and enjoyed each other's company. But that practice stopped after the quarrel. There was nothing left in both of their hearts but bitterness and anger towards each other. One morning, John answered the knock at his door. It was a carpenter. The carpenter asked if there was any work for him to do. John said, well, I think there is some work that you could do. So he, he took the carpenter to the place where the two, two properties met, his and his brothers. And he showed him how his brother had uh, taken a, a bulldozer and created uh, a creek where the meadow used to be once upon a time. And John said, I know he did this to anger me. So I want you to help me to get even with him by building a fence so that I don't have to see his face anymore. I don't have to see his property anymore. And John immediately after giving that work to the carpenter, he went on a short vacation. And the carpenter started working very hard. And when John came back, to his shock, he noticed there was no fence. The carpenter used all his skill and the wood and built a bridge instead, instead of a fence. His brother Bill, in the meantime, was noticing this bridge being built by the carpenter of John. And he was quite moved that his brother could do such a kind act of love to reconcile each other once again. The two brothers finally met in the middle of that bridge and embraced each other and asked each other's forgiveness. What a joy it was for the carpenter to see that, that what he planned, it worked. Soon after that, the two brothers, Bill and John, saw the carpenter packing his goods to leave. Both the brothers asked him to stay for some more time. They said, we have more work for you to do. But the carpenter replied, I'm sorry, I have other bridges to build. Yes, dearly beloved, sin brought the separation between God and man with a gulf that was so wide. But there came a divine carpenter to build a bridge across the chasm with his own cross. You know, we gave him the pieces of wood for one purpose, but he took the same pieces of wood and made a bridge that would connect God and man, that would connect heaven and earth. Jesus paid it all on the cross. God and man can embrace each other on the cross. He connected heaven and earth by the cross and by the torn veil. The separation that caused is gone by the cross of the divine carpenter and now God and man meet together on the bridge of the cross. Don't you want the divine carpenter to build bridges for you? You might be having bitterness with somebody but ask this divine carpenter to remove the wall and build a bridge and he will do exactly that for you. The veil is torn for you, beloved. God is inviting you and me to come boldly to the throne of grace 
because of the open wail, the tone wail. He's waiting for you. What holds you back? Make that decision today. Oh, oh. 